Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is a report I received that anti-Israel propaganda was being handed out at the IRT subway stop on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Let it be clear from the outset. In today's world, anti-Israel is always and without exception a synonym for anti-Semitic. Those who feel moved to espouse this particular form of racism attempt to couch their hatred by cloaking it in anti-Israel rhetoric. They claim that Israel is the oppressor of the Palestinians. For the, most of these anti-Semites, the best solution to the issue is for Israel to simply disappear. The Upper West Side is a vibrant, eclectic New York community. It's also a social anomaly. It's a bastion of Jewish liberalism. It is also a huge center of support for Israel, even among liberal Jewish members of the community. The organized liberal Jewish community is deeply, severely, cuttingly critical of Israel, but they are still supportive of Israel's right to exist. It's an important issue. I call them Haaretz Jews. They get their information and assume stances from the liberal Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Often in discussions, they will assert that their point of view is not anti-Israel. In fact, cannot possibly be anti-Israel because they admittedly are mimicking Haaretz. What was happening at the IRT subway stop was not the first time an anti-Israel group used the Upper West Side as a forum to spread their lies about Israel. What defines it as a watershed event, however, is that these particular disseminators of hatred and vitriolic disinformation took up their positions in one of the most popular and preferred venues of politicians. This space, this subway station, is visited by more politicians than any other single space in all of New York City. And there's a reason for that. It's because of the people who move in and out of those subway turnstiles, especially the Jews who use those turnstiles. This locale has the distinction of having the highest voter, tur voter turnout numbers of any polling station in the entire city of New York. They are active political citizens. They even vote in local primaries. The anti-Israel propagandists did not get their warmest welcome, but neither were they ousted. The sad truth is that they are becoming more and more at home in Jewish areas of the city. Their demonstration was peaceful, and they had the right to speak their minds and dis disseminate the material, even if it is lies. The most concerning issue is that these haters of Israel have an advantage in today's market of ideas. And that's because Jews in general, and Israel in particular, are perceived as oppressors. In concrete terms, it's hard to imagine how Jews in Israel can be seen as an oppressor. After all, Jews, the Jew is the greatest victim in all of history. The word scapegoat comes from the Bible and was brought into the language as a way to describe Jewish existence. The word ghetto was created to describe the place where Jews were to live. The concept of racism was created to justify the modern hatred of Jews, and it's those racists who created the word anti-Semite. Even the word Holocaust was created in order to describe the greatest single murder of a people in all of history, the Jewish people. The world is a different place today because of the Holocaust, when that unfathomable became a reality. A plan was set into action to murder an entire people, and before they were stopped, the Nazis succeeded in murdering six million Jews. But time marches on and memories fade, even global memory. And of late, ideas and thinking have shifted. Past realities are less important. A new way of thinking has emerged, and today Jews are perceived as oppressors. This new perceptive, uh, perspective is called intersectionalism. The idea is extremely powerful among young people, specifically at university and college campuses, and among liberals, even among Jewish liberals on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Intersectionalism is based on the view that all abused share one common abuser. It's a game of connect the dots that explains how Jews were transformed from victim to oppressor. Israel is oppressing the Palestinians. Israel is the Jewish state. All Jews are therefore oppressors. Add to that the fact that Jews are almost exclusively white and the dots are all lined up and the link is secure. Just as the oppressors are all linked, so too are the oppressed all linked. So Palestinians are directly linked to Black Lives Matter. 
even though there is no connection at all between the groups. Not demographically, not ideologically, not at all. It's all impossible to convince intersectionalists of Israel's right or that Jews are actually victims. They cling steadfastly to their belief and will find satisfaction only if more Jews actually die. In more ways than we can possibly imagine, the Holocaust still resonates extremely loudly. Here is another very different example of what I've been talking about. Like many Jews, Alfred Weinberger and his wife, Marie, hid their belongings before fleeing as the Nazis invaded Paris. Weinberger, an avid art collector, hid his collection of precious paintings and jewelry in the secure Paris bank vault. The Weinbergers survived the war, but were never reunited with their belongings. The vault had been looted by the Nazis. Their granddaughter, Sylvia Sulitzer, a French citizen who was born after the war and lived with her grandparents for several years, came to New York recently to see one of those paintings for the first time. The story of Alfred and Marie and their lost collection is unfortunately not unique. Nazis not only looted banks, they gathered art off walls of Jewish homes. They created an office charged with the responsibility of acquiring art. They looted over 100,000 pieces and kept track of each and every piece. In their arrogance, they kept impeccable records documenting their activities, making it all the easier for Sulitzer to finally be re reunited with the work that had been looted from the Paris bank vault. In 1919, the painting was actually painted by French Impressionist Renoir and is one of his last works ever. It's entitled Two Women in a Garden. The painting and all the others from the Weinberger collection was listed by name in the Nazi records. In the aftermath of World War II, the art world was flush with art, despite the fact that provenance of much of the art was in question. Many private people and even reputable institutions and museums elected not to ask the obvious questions, where it came from. It is acquisitions that were important, and as long as there, there was a line of succession, however dubious it was, the art was bought and shared and donated and displayed even. Two Women in the Garden made its way from Paris to South Africa to London to Zurich and finally to Christie's in New York. The art spoke for itself. The people kept mum. Eventually, those lucky enough to survive the Nazi killing machine and their children and grandchildren began to demand the return of their family possessions. Court cases ensued. Settlements were made. The Nazis lost the war, yet their spoils remained and were traded. Such is the nature of war. The prophet Hosea, in Hosea chapter 10, verse 13, describes the evil inherent in profiting from the pain and destruction of others. He says, actually, you have plowed wickedness and reaped and thriving crop injustice. This type of behavior was to be ex uh, expected from Hitler and his Nazi army. They kept track of the name of each piece of art. Art was a precious and to be preserved element. Jewish lives were not. But museums that they chose to knowingly profit off the loot of Jews murdered by the Nazis? That still boggles the mind and unsettles the soul. These centers of culture were profiting from Nazi theft, giving the Nazis a posthumous victory. Many museums and institutions proudly hung the works on their walls and in their galleries. Others put them in storage, hoping that with time the claims would die down and the pieces could come out of the hiding places. The FBI does not agree and has been tracking the works of art for years. It's the stuff that movies are made of. And the 2015 hit movie, Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren, is a powerful example of the fight by a Holocaust survivor from Vienna to regain her family's possessions. Some museums, acknowledging that the works were probably stolen or looted, are actually fighting to keep the Nazi art that they have acquired. Neither the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, California, nor the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art at the University of Oklahoma denies that some of their art has been stolen, and yet they are arguing through their lawyers that the families of the original owners did not move fast enough in making their claims and as such forfeit their ownership. To make matters worse, this past July, a federal court in California sided with the museums and ruled that the artwork will remain with the museum. 
Other museums fully acknowledge the status of some pieces in their collection. The Louvre in Paris has created a permanent exhibit of looted art. They have thousands of pieces and they're paying tribute to the destruction wrought by the Nazis and they're trying to reunite the art with families from which it was looted. To date, the French have successfully returned 45,000 works of art to the families of the original owners. Sylvie Solitzer will probably have to sell two women in the garden to cover the cost of recovering the famous piece of art. She was visibly shaken when she saw the painting and thanked everyone who helped her get it back. This is her quote. It's a lot of emotion because you really realize how people are concerned about what happened because it's so easy just to say, okay, it's the past. We'll never forget. We can't forget. But it's very important that we, me, as a human, as a Jewish person, to consider that you have people who work for justice, unquote. Six million Jews were murdered by the Nazis. That evil will never be erased. That pain cannot be eased. But at least one woman received some small portion of justice. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. I want to discuss two columns from the New York Post. The New York Post used to draw chuckles, but it is now an excellent paper with truly excellent op-eds especially. They are critical, equally critical of everyone and all sides and scoop often numerous stories across the globe, but especially with regard to the Middle East. Most importantly, they discuss essential questions, especially about Israel and the greater Middle East as a whole. First up is a column by Benny Avni. It's entitled, Abbas says no to peace. In print, the column appeared on September 28, 2018. And it was titled, Robe Maps, Roadblock. Abbas's anti-Trump gamble is a disaster for Palestinians. Online, it appeared on September 27th. Avni begins. Mahmoud Abbas, the aging president of the not quite state of Palestine, aims to lead a worldwide anti-Trump resistance movement. At least that's the takeaway from his defiant address to the United Nations General Assembly on Thursday. There's the obvious retort, get in line, buddy. More seriously, how does Abbas's renewed anti-US bravado help the Palestinian cause, not to mention Mideast peace? On Wednesday, at the margins of the annual UN Gab Fest, Abbas invited representatives from dozens of countries to his Midtown Hotel to talk peace. He pointedly avoided inviting America or Israel. This was all about everyone else. Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking for decades has been steered by America, Russia, the United Nations, and the European Union, known as the Quartet. In reality, however, talks between Ramallah and Jerusalem were mostly chaperoned by Washington. Avni lays the foundation. He explains that Abbas is lashing out against the United States and it will not help their cause. In fact, it will only hurt Palestinians. Avni continues, Meanwhile, the 83-year-old Abbas, who was yet to designate a successor 13 years after elected for a four-year stint, undermines the Palestinian cause by turning his back on any peace plan America would propose, no matter who's president. And if, by some miracle, he does agree, a successor may well reverse his decision. Either way, no Israeli-Palestinian plan can work unless America steers and guarantees it every step of the way, including implementation. So yes, President Trump, publish your Israeli-Palestinian real estate deal. As long as Ramallah's leadership succession remains unresolved, don't expect peace, but the plan will hopefully help Arabs come out of the Israel ties closet. Abbas, with his eternal no, and current clumsy attempt to marginalize America won't be history's first roaring mouse, nor will he be the first leader history has forgotten. Avni is correct, but unfortunately, Abbas and the Palestinians will never hear his warning. Second up is another column from the New York Post. The column was written by Daniel Shapiro, a distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. Shapiro served as U.S. ambassador to Israel during the Obama administration. After his term, he stayed in Israel to live. His son joined the IDF. The online column is entitled, How to Make Russia Back Off in the Middle East, and it appeared on September 25th. In print, the column appeared two days later, on September 27th. 
The column is entitled, In Print, Rain in Russia. It's threatening Israel and aiding Iran in Syria. This is how Shapiro begins. For the first time in decades, Israel finds itself on the receiving end of Russian threats. The tensions follow the downing last week of a Russian Ilushin IL-20 military aircraft and the deaths of its 15 crew members by Syrian air defense batteries responding to Israeli airstrikes on Iranian weapons shipments in Syria. A crisis like this one cries out for U.S. diplomacy to help manage it. So far, there's no sign of it. Two things have facilitated Israel's campaign against Iranian weapons in Syria. The careful professional approach of the Israeli Air Force, which hits its intended targets and avoids collateral damage, and Israel's deft management of its relationship with Russia since the Russian military deployed to Syria in 2015. Shapiro then illustrates just how complicated the situation is in Syria and how Russia and Israel could come to blows. He explains that the Syrian downing of the Russian plane, in which 15 Russians were killed and Israel was blamed, is a huge and very dangerous issue. Shapiro continues, Trump made one positive move recently, indicating a reversal of his position that U.S. troops would leave eastern Syria imminently. As the counter-ISIS campaign nears completion, those troops still help prevent Iranian access to portions of Syria it could use to ship and base weapons. If Israel is constrained, U.S. forces may yet be called upon to conduct more kinetic actions against Iranian weapons. Finally, the administration and Congress should accelerate through advanced appropriations the $5 billion in missile defense funding promised Israel over the next decade in the 2016 Memorandum of Understanding that will help ensure Israel is equipped to defend itself from the most dangerous Iranian weapons in Syria. Last week's incident was a warning that Syria can get even worse. The United States should act to contain the damage, defend our ally, and keep Russian reactions and Iranian ambition in check. Compelling analysis from a former ambassador. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show three cartoons today. The first comes from the United Arab Emirates, and the second two come from Israel. The first cartoon is by Parish, and was published on September 19, 2018, in the Khalij Times, United Arab Emirates. Donald Trump is on the ship. He's the captain, and he's holding a telescope. The name of the ship is Trump's Peace Proposal. It is run aground and is lodged in the desert. On the ground are skeletons and messages that read embassy shifting, closing of PLO mission in U.S., Umrah aid cut, and then a sign that reads Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a powerful statement and critique of Trump's peace plan, and yet is still very funny. The next two cartoons are from Israel, and they are, you guessed it, of course, from Yaakov Kirshen, called Dry Bones. They were published on October 3rd, 2018. The first one is entitled Inside the New York Times Editorial Department. A staffer is talking to the editor and he asks or says, our latest attack on Trump is really heavy. The editor responds, yes, it's eight pages and 14,128 words long. The piece is obviously lampooning the New York Times and its coverage, which has gotten a little out of hand, actually is almost exclusively about Trump bashing. This last cartoon is also by Dry Bones, it's entitled War. Putin is wearing a helmet, and written on the helmet is the word war, W-A-R. The caption reads, while the world is watching Russian missiles being sent into Syria, Putin has just launched the first test of his supersonic missiles in the Arctic Circle. Illusionists call this sleight of hand. You are watching one thing, or looking one way, and that allows the illusionists to quickly do something that tricks or fools you while no one is watching. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. New numbers are in. According to the Jewish Agency, the Jewish population increased over the last year by 100,000. The total number of Jews in the world now is 14.7 million people. There are 6.6 .6 million Jews living in Israel, 8.1 million Jews living in the diaspora. That means they live outside Israel. Of that number, 5.7 million live in the United States. The second largest population outside of Israel is France with 453,000, 
currently living there. The third largest population or community outside of Israel is Canada, 391,000 Jews. The lessons gleaned from these numbers are important, but numbers can be deceptive. The question needs to be asked, what activity do these 14.7 million Jews actually practice? In other words, what criteria was used in labeling someone Jewish? The answer is that these 14.7 million Jews classify themselves as Jewish. That's it. The leader of Hezbollah was moved to tears during a speech he himself delivered. Not quite what you would expect from Hassan Nasrallah, the massive leader of a huge terrorist organization. Nasrallah was begging his followers not to cut the faces of their children. Mutilation and self-mutilation are part of Shiite tradition, especially on Ashura. Ashura is the anniversary of the brutal death of Muhammad's grandson, Hussein ibn Ali, during the Battle of Karbala. To reenact this historical event, Shiite Muslims whip themselves and others. They also cut themselves and each other. Nasrallah said, the whole world sees what is happening here today, and I ask you all to restrain yourselves and to distance yourselves from anyone who seeks to create a negative impression about us, unquote. Then he started to cry. ISIS, Nasrallah said, is the real enemy. And he says, ISIS leaves an impression that causes the most harm to us. Islamic scholars condemn them. Crocodile tears, perhaps, effective, only time will tell. Saib Arikat, chief negotiator for the Palestinians, has made it very clear that Palestinians will not accept any U.S. plan. More than that, he suggested that the United States will never even present the plan. Arikat explained the reason for the Palestinian rejection by saying that the United States has sided with Israel on every issue. In the Reuters interview recently, which took place in Jericho, Arikat said, I don't think they will ever introduce a plan. He continued, the whole world is rejecting their ideas. They're already implementing their plan by changing the terms of reference. Arikat is not a prophet, but he is correct that at this point, the U.S. sponsored plan will not succeed. No plan, no peace plan can succeed if one of the parties refuses to participate in it. Ari Fould was murdered in cold blood by a 17-year-old Palestinian terrorist. The attack took place between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. By now, everyone, I hope, knows his name. Ari was a hero, cut down in the prime of his life, in the parking lot of a Gush Etzion shopping mall, in the spot frequented by both Palestinians and Israelis. Hamas and Islamic Jihad of Gaza both issued statements supporting the murder of this father of four. They proclaimed, we welcome the stabbing attack in Bethlehem, which coincided with the killings of our people during the March of Return. The attack makes it clear that our people wish to continue the Jerusalem Intifada, to resist the occupation by using all means necessary, is our legitimate right. The terrorists continued, the attack is a natural response to the aggression and crimes perpetrated by the Zionist terrorists against our people, our land, and our holy places. We praise our people in the West Bank and call for a continuation of resistance against Israel and attacks against the settlers. These comments are official. They're not off the cuff. These terrorists want to stimulate more terror, to murder more innocents. They take pride in the murder of Ari Fould. They justify the murder of Ari Fould. They may think of themselves as freedom fighters, but they are nothing more than cold-blooded murderers. Reports abound that Syria accidentally shot down the Russian IL-20 aircraft carrying 14 Russian servicemen and one pilot. Some background is required. The Syrians have beefed up their anti-air defenses with the help of Russia. Before the incident occurred, missiles were headed toward the Syrian port of Latakia. According to Israeli sources, Latakia, the port itself, was storing new weapons that would alter the status quo. So Israel launched an attack against the weapons cache in Latakia. In response, on a Sunday night, Syria successfully struck some of the incoming Israeli rockets. But the next night, Monday night, Rather than shooting down Israeli planes, they mistakenly shot down the plane of their ally, Russia. One of the dangers of having high-tech weapons is that when using them, they can cause great damage. The irony should not be lost. Russia improves the anti-missile defense system of Syria only to be shot down by that very same defense system. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. 
Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that, as I mentioned earlier about illusionists, there is a long history of Jews as magicians and illusionists. The original magicians were portrayed as Jews with Jewish hats. These were hats that looked like what we would call today a dunce cap. Even Mickey Mouse in the movie Fantasia wore the famous magician's hat. It's also the hat that Merlin wore. The Maharal of Prague, the great rabbi of Prague, who created the golem, is portrayed in sculptures throughout Prague wearing the magician's hat. Why? Because it really was the Jewish hat. In certain places during the Middle Ages, Jews were forced to wear badges and live in ghettos. In other places, they were forced to wear this hat. Some of the great Jewish illusionists and magicians include David Copperfield, David Blaine, Uri Geller, Max Malini, Herb Zaro, Fred Capps, Abe Horowitz. But the greatest of all was, of course, Harry Houdini. He was the greatest master. Houdini was the son of a rabbi and a classic Jewish immigrant with a wonderful Jewish immigrant story. His original name was Eric Weiss, born in Budapest. His Yiddish name, his Jewish name, was Herschel. The world is a different an even better place because of the contributions of the Jewish illusionist Harry Herschel Houdini. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.